Bill, how are you? <laughs> Can you hear me, Bill? Yeah, perfect. Let me let me be courteous and turn off my uh, iPhone. Okay. Nothing worse than doing a broadcast and it goes because you know, I got crazy sounds on here. So let me turn it off. And uh, boom. Going to talk about some of my favorite stuff, Yogananda. Oh uh, yes, uh, you, 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 know, you know, I yeah. had my family, my family had a relationship with Kriyananda when he was just a monk at SRF back in the late forties, or, or I guess it was nineteen fifties. In the fifties, he was my Sunday school teacher. Really? Yeah. Oh my God, that's so nice, so beautiful. Yeah. Oh, it was. Uh, uh, he he would leave from L.A. For Mother Center, and he'd come up there to uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. And we had a group in uh, Saratoga, a little town of Saratoga. And we used to meet in this art studio, okay, you know, yeah. in a week, artist loft. And then we turned it into a meditation place. There'd only be you know, a dozen people, maybe 15, 20. I mean, it wasn't a big group. Okay. So then he vice president, and then and then he didn't, then he still came up, but it wasn't like he was. Mm -hmm. But I was like. There was only a couple of kids involved. I was, I was basically with the adults, uh, and I was, you know, first, second, third grade, fourth grade. I mean, it was like, yeah, so that was kind of a nice privilege. And then when he left, uh, and went up to uh, Nevada City, uh, I visited there a few times. That's if you ever been there, that's really a neat place. Yeah, well, I haven't been in into U.S. <laughs> It, it, it's it's a beautiful thing, of course. And, uh, and then they got a Ananda's got a thing in Italy, which I, I didn't visit, but they got one in India. Yeah, yeah. That uh, this guy I'm, I'm hanging around with now, Grunov, who's uh, teaches Kriya Yoga, follows Yogananda. Um, they that ashram, the Ananda Center, whatever it is, and his ashram, they they have dinner together and stuff. Yeah. So I think that's kind of cool. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's so great. So that's, that's my background, but my family's been uh, with uh, Yogananda and SRF basically for, uh, since I've been born, 1946. So you could say I've been in SRF for, you know, 75 plus years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but when you're little, I mean, you don't, you're, you're, you're drafted in, you don't join, but uh, exactly. I never left. And uh, so that's my background. And then I was in Vietnam. And when I came home, I had a friend and we used to go to his house and meditate in Berkeley, California. And we meditated at his house and we had, oh, we, we had some, some of the old lay disciples of SRF. Some of the people that were uh, Kamala. I don't know if you've ever heard that name, but Kamala. She, Kamala Silva, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She yeah. was she was there with her husband Ed, I think that was his name, and we had all these other high powered people, and there was just a, two handfuls, maybe maybe eight, ten people. Yes, and uh, it was a sweet group. But we'd go in there and we'd sit and meditate all Sunday. It was just oh. beautiful. And uh, anyway, my friend uh, became a a monk uh, at SRF. Jeez. Uh, since 1971 or two, I think I just got a Christmas card from, but he's never, he's never allowed them to promote him. He's happy being a brahmachari. He doesn't, he doesn't want rank, doesn't want name, doesn't want fame. He's just doing his own thing. And he was a, uh, he was in Vietnam. He was in helicopters as well. Mm -hmm. So, wow. uh, and a lot of people don't understand this outside of, uh, a limited amount of people that spiritual warriors have been a thing forever you know yes. you go back to Bhava Gita, right you got absolutely you got arjuna being told go go fight this war and he goes hey look that's my brother so that's your duty <laughs> right yeah yeah yeah, yeah and uh, so yogananda during world war ii uh he'd be picking up military guys hitchhiking you know and stuff and He'd take and he'd feed him and wine and dine. Well, he'd not wine and dine him, but he'd die. <laughs> <laughs> not not <laughs> wine. <laughs> so uh, I heard a lot of good stories of that. But a lot of the new people into 
the new age thing into into Yogananda and into SRF or I don't know about Ananda, but there's this holier than thou attitude like well, we didn't serve, you know, we didn't fight the war. You know what? Yogananda was a supporter of World War II. He was a supporter of our veterans. And he was told at SRF, there is no draft deferment. When when they became a monk and their draft number come up, they would say, Go. Mm-hmm. Duty. Yeah. Yeah. And, sure. and people don't know that background history. But I remember as a kid, I, I, it's just some beautiful stories, if you don't mind me sharing. Absolutely. And, uh, Absolutely. Please. I heard this one from from old timers when I was little, and then I hold I, then I heard it again about fifty years later. But uh, there was this uh, guy driving down in his I don't know nineteen thirty something car or maybe it was forties I don't know, and 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 he's trying to go from Seattle to San Diego for a job interview, and he's out of money. He's got just enough gas money to get there, and he's going down Highway One going back uh, past uh, Encinitas. I think that's the, the, by the beach there, Encinitas. Yeah. And, and, and he, his car gets a flat tire, blows his tire out. And he's sitting there and he's just looking at it. And it's right in front of the Self-Realization Fellowship Temple there. <laughs> See, you know, and, and Yogananda just kind of <laughs> walks out there, disarms him. You got a problem? You know, what can I do? What can I do to make your life better? What do you need to make your life better? He's asking this guy, right? Here's Yogananda out there asking, what do you want? I'll give it to you, right? So the guy goes, and he tells him all his woes. You know, he's trying to get down there and get this job. And only thing I need in life is I need a tire for this car. Yogananda says, let's take a walk. So they walk down to the beach, Swami's Beach, right off there, you know, below the cliffs. And and you're walking along, and there in the in the waves coming ashore is a brand new tire floating in the tide. And and, really? and, and it comes right on the beach, and Yogananda just picks it up and goes, That's all you needed? Oh. <laughs> goes, yeah. So he gets his tire fixed and he leaves. And, and I, I always hear that story. I'm thinking, what an opportunity lost. The, yeah. the man didn't recognize. Who and what Paramahansa Yogananda was, and so when he's asked, "What can I give you? What can I make give you for make your life better?" Yeah, you know, not wisdom, meditation. It's just, <laughs> just a tire. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and then have Yogananda go, "Okay, that's what." That's Could you what imagine you the tire yeah. walking? Up, it's brand new, and it's the exact size and make to match. I mean, it was a perfect match. So you got to look at that and you got to go, that is interesting sequence of events. What's the odds, right? Exactly. Yeah. (laughs) So then uh, during World War II, and he was entertaining a bunch of people at Encinitas and uh, they made a punch bowl of stuff to drink. You know, one of I think it was one of those banana and milk and raisins and, you know, and they, it's just a great drink and honey. I don't know if you ever had it, but anyway, there's this punch bowl out there, stuff to drink. And more people showed up than, you know, about three times more people showed up than, than they had enough stuff to drink for. And they kept telling Yogan, he says, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Just keep serving. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And it gets down to a half bowl and people keep coming and keep coming and he keeps serving and they keep ladling out. And it never got below a half a bowl. Always just, taste. Always how much, yeah. how much they gave away. It doesn't matter, yeah. <laughs> it never got in. So when you hear stories like that when you're a young person, of course, that's just like, wow, that's really kind of cool stuff. And uh, so uh, stories that I don't think uh, the people in Europe have heard because they're not written down anywhere. Yeah, yeah. Well, I have heard the, the story, of, uh, certainly the story about uh, what you say, the, the milk. I think it, that's the babaji drink, you, you know, bananas, milk, and oats or something. Yeah, that's Babaji. <laughs> Babaji's drink. We drink it when when there is a, a Kriya ceremony. A Kriya. Yeah, I, uh, I I I am glutton for that. I mean, yeah. I, it's I, so I, good. I, it's so good. Yeah, it's in. in I mean, you're supposed to drink. Yeah, you're supposed to drink a you know a sampling of this. You yeah, know? yeah, a little bit like like this. But you you can't stop if you if they give no. you like a gallon of this, you will gulp it on, and it's like you. 
Yep. It, it never fails you. It's like, oh, it's so good. It's so good. And I, I always wanted to, to know the recipe and I did. I still don't know it, you know? <laughs> Here's what, all right, first off, you, the raisins, so people don't realize to make the right. raisins work in this, you soak the raisins in water overnight. All right. Then they get all uh -huh. spongy. spongy. Yeah. Spongy. And then you take it, and not nowadays, back then, I don't know what they did, but nowadays you put that in a blender right. with whatever kind of milk you're using. Exactly. And if you don't drink cow's milk, you could put almond milk in, I guess, yeah. but it works yeah. best with cow's milk. Right. And, and and then you put your honey in to taste. And you, and that's just, <laughs> and then you put your bananas in, of course. Right. And uh, soft bananas. So the secret is you got to soak the raisins. All right. Okay. Okay. All so right. it's like life. Secret of life is you have to soak your soul in meditation. Exactly. Otherwise, it's, it's not going to yeah. make. It's not, it's not going to be right. No. So uh, <laughs> anyway, so that's kind of my background, and uh, I uh, I have been traveling around the world doing talks and lectures since I retired about twenty some years ago. I'm an old guy, believe it or not. I'm. I'm well, I'm going to be 36 here in uh, two months or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, and if you could, you can't tell, but this is like my face has got kind of, I got a, over a hundred and some stitches in my face in the last 10 months. Right. I've had oh. nine tumors taken out and then they just did the operation a week ago and they, they cut a big tumor out of here, but now they got to go back in and, uh, uh, and cut everything out between the eyes. So this whole part of the nose is going to disappear probably and be rebuilt. So I thought this is a good time to do interviews. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, <laughs> guys, you, and, and see, I don't, you know, it's just a body, right? So if they cut yes. it up, I'm exactly. scarred. But when you're doing a talk and you're, and you're, and you're trying to give a message, yeah. people will focus on the blemish. They'll focus on that because yeah. the mind's going to go. Yeah. So, you know, for 10 days of healing, my, my nose looks okay. Absolutely. So it is what it is. So uh, I, I I brought uh, this guru, uh, Gurunov is his name, and uh, I talked about him just briefly before. Yes. And he and we got him a, uh, he wanted to visit uh, Yogananda's headquarters, right, you know. Uh -huh. So he went there. We went with him in 2010, I think. And what was really sweet was the monks came out and they gave him books and flowers and fruit and all that stuff, right? But they asked him, what do you want to see? You know, they were going to give him a tour and all this. Yeah. Just let me meditate in Yogananda's bedroom. All right. So we had a evening, you know, from late afternoon to whatever amount of time he wanted. It was me and him and a couple of followers. And we got this. If, if you ever have the opportunity to meditate, in Yogananda's be uh, his bedroom at uh, at the Mother Center, it's it's just a beautiful experience. I mean, it's just saturated. It feels good. They got everything in place. It's just anyway. So there I am, and and I, and I thought that was well, it was kind of nice, you know. It was just kind of beautiful. And uh, anyway, that's it. Uh, anything you want to ask me? Otherwise, I can go on and tell you stories about Babaji. I can tell you stories about uh, Sri Teshwar. I can tell you all, all these. Yeah. Babaji's cave. Yeah. 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 Please go ahead. I think uh, it hey. would be very interesting uh, the story about when Babaji came. There was, a, 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 the, the, I don't remember exactly the story because I, I saw a video of yours like a year or two ago, I remember. And you said something about Babaji coming and, uh, uh, when you were little. There were some candles around or a bed or something. What was this? Uh, All right. Let, let's talk about my four last encounters with uh, Babaji. Okay. okay. I, I mean, I had a near-death experience at eight years old. I was in the hospital for a year and I, I saw yes. great saints and sages and a life, a life, not review backwards, but one forward for 50 years, Yeah, which is another story. But <laughs> I, I, I had my uh, naughty palm leaf reading done in India at the, that, uh, at the at the command of the of the guru, I was staying in his ashram. You got to go get this. I said, I don't believe in this stuff. He says, No, <laughs> I don't care if you don't believe in it. It believes in you. You got to go, and I don't want to go. So anyway, I went, and uh, 
part of that part of that reading said that I'd seen Lord Shiva in many forms and never recognized him, meaning like Babaji, you know, and all these other things. Yeah. But I never recognized uh, him. But from that point forward, from that year forward, I would recognize him. And that was interesting because then shortly thereafter, I'm back at the ashram. The first recognition, we're sitting around a sacred fire uh, in this jungle ashram outside of Pune. And uh, the guru goes to bed and it's just, a couple of guys left there. There's a guy who used to be a rock and roll guy, and then he got spiritualized and gave up the rock and roll and the drugs and everything. Really yeah. nice guy, a guy from California. And there were some other Indians and stuff. And, and we just, it's around the fire, and you start telling ghost stories and demon stories and all that stuff, you know, and I'm going. And so there at this sacred place, I go, I said, I've seen it, I've done it, nothing scares me. And they go, oh. They never challenge the gods. I go, come on, you know, come on. So I, I've challenged the gods, right? So we put out the campfire and it's like about one o'clock in the morning or something. And so I go back to this bungalow, this thing I got where I'm at. And I'm the only one in it. And I open the door, total darkness. I got my flashlight. And they're sitting on my bed looking right at me is the classic Babaji image. I mean, the classic, yeah. you know, with the, you know, with the shiny wet skin, the long, the long hair. hair. Yeah, the whole thing, right? Yeah. Except lasers, lights, like, coming right at you, you know, like, oh, you're not scared of anything, huh? <laughs> so all of a sudden, I'm seeing this, like, laser light coming at me. And so I kind of go, oh, and I, and I throw my flashlight up, and it falls on the ground, and I pick up the flashlight, and then, it's gone, right? And I go, Phew. thank God nobody saw that because I just told everybody nothing scares me, you know, and I was like the big war hero and, and the guru kept calling me the general, nothing scares Bill, right? So the next morning, I didn't tell nobody and I'm walking across the ashram to get breakfast and uh, I hear these footsteps behind me and it's torn off. All five foot five or four, whatever how tall he is behind me, right? And he, and, and he looks at me and he goes, Bill, I thought you weren't afraid of anything. <laughs> go, what? He, you, right? he knew. So he, he, knew. Knew. <laughs> he knew, right? He knew. So I, my punishment was when we got to breakfast, he says, Bill, you want to tell the group something? I don't know. He says, no, you want to tell them what happened. So then I had to own up the fact that, you know, for, there I was, you know, and I had this experience, but it was like, it, it shocked me right away, you know. So lesson there is never never challenge the universe never say you're not afraid of anything or you know, you know whatever whatever you don't challenge yeah. god like that and so that was a real big lesson but in 2004 my first trip to india i had this thing when i was a child i read autobiography when i was eight, nine years old when I was in the hospital. And that was like, hey, I, I read that book. And it was like, the only thing I focused on that book was Babaji's Cave. I'm going there someday. Bob, I'm nine years old. Yeah. Babaji's yeah. Cave, I'm going there, right? <laughs> so I had that 50 year or something desire to go to Babaji's Cave. And so I just had like 10 or 12 heart attacks before I, I went there. And I thought, you know, I better go before I'm, I'm not able to go, right? So... I go there with the express purpose of finding the place. I had no idea. I, I had a vague area and I hired a driver and a guide and we went and we asked and we drove all through the Himalayas. We finally found a YSS ashram and it happened to be the one that takes care of the cave, you know? And anyway, so <laughs> they, I told them what I was looking for and everything. And it was uh, the week we, we, we went there, there was just me, the driver, and, and the guy I was traveling with and the Swami and, and his helper. Everybody had gone to uh, Rishi. There was a, uh, a convocation going on and he was going to be leaving in a couple of days. He says, he says, well, you want to go to the cave? He says, I got no guides, nobody to show you. And we don't normally just let people go up there and explore because it's, you know, it's hard to find, et cetera, et cetera. I said, no. I said, I've waited, I'm, I'm 58 and a half. 
I'm almost 59 years old. I don't know if I'm ever going to step foot here again. I got to see that. He says, well, we'll think about it. So the next morning, I, I, I go see the Swami, and he's got this piece of paper, and he says, okay, if you're going to go, you're on your own. And, and, he, and he takes a pencil, and he chicken scratches this. You go down the road, oh, maybe eight miles, maybe 20 miles. He says, I don't know. You go down the road, and then you'll see some kind of road off to the left. Uh, ignore that one. And then go to the next one, and it's probably that one. I don't think it's the next one. These are the kind of directions we're getting. And then when you get off that road, it, it'll kind of go to a dirt road and then stop on that dirt road and then look for a trailhead that goes up this thing. And he says, a lot of them, but find the one that looks like it's the one. So that's the instructions we got. <laughs> I'm going. And he says, now, if, if you can follow those instructions, you can go. And I go, yeah, 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 yeah. My, my driver's looking at like me like, he's going to drive me. He has no clue where he's taking me, right? So... And his only only order that he had was be back by 5 30 because I'm gonna close up the gate to the ashram. And we're leaving like at nine o'clock in the morning. Yeah, yeah, okay. So we get <laughs> in the vehicle, we drive down the road. And intuitively, I got uh, we pass a couple of roads. Okay, let's take this one. Went down it and then there were some other choices. Okay, we drove down this dirt road and it kind of kind of ended, but there was a trail, a big trail ahead of it. And, and I told the driver, well, you go sleep here. We'll be back. So he did. And we went off and we looked at the trails. And then we saw a sign that said, Abhijit's Cave. And it had an arrow. All the trouble was, it was sitting in a, 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 about 30 yards away in the dirt in a little gutter. So it came off the mountain and fell down. And there was like 10 other cow trails, you know, people trails, animal trails. So we didn't know which one it came off. So we just, randomly picked one and we started walking. Now at this time I was having heart problems. I was having uh, brain seizures from epilepsy. I, I, I was, we didn't bring any water. We didn't bring any coats, jackets, not, uh, flashlights, nothing. We're prepared just to take a little jaunt up this hill. And so and I got dysentery and I, I lost 26 pounds in three weeks in India, which is a lot of weight to just but I'm, I'm going up that hill, right? So we'll go up the hill and I'm just not doing too good. And we got lost, of course. And it's like four hours where it should only be, you know, I don't know, 90 minutes. I have no clue how long it should take to get there. Uh, so finally, we see this temple at the top of this hill. We go up the top and it's Babaji's temple that they built. It's beautiful. And, you get, and he gave us the keys. We had the keys. We opened it up and we can unlock it. And we had the temple to ourselves. And inside this temple, if the people go there, it's 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 really a good place to meditate. There's a big, huge portrait, I don't know, six, eight, 10 feet, a big, big Babaji portrait color right down. When you're sitting and you're looking at this big portrait on the wall framed. And, uh, but I got in there and I was so, my heart was pounding. And I was like, I was really having some medical problems. And I go, oh, okay, this is good. But I'm so grateful. But then I realized, we're just at the temple. We're not at the cave yet. Right? <laughs> so then I see there's, we go out the back door of this place and, and then there's a sign that says, you know, the cave up this way. And then it's like up, uphill, you kind of got like steps and yeah. it's, it's, it's a good grade going up. <clears throat> we finally get to the top and there's this cave opening, but it's got like a jail door on it to, to keep vandals out. Unfortunately, even in India, even devotees coming there to worship, they were chipping pieces of the cave away. You know, a souvenir I got. Yeah. Rock from yeah. <laughs> yeah. I did pick up a couple of loose rocks that were mm -hmm. yeah. inside the cave that were loose. Mm -hmm. And I, I gave those to a couple of people when I got back for their altar. So I went inside, unlocked the gate, got in there. And there was a blanket down there and we, we meditated and and I'm kind of going in and out. I don't know if I'm, I'm, I'm high on the experience or I'm having a medical problem. It was kind of like borderline. But I had this list. I had a typed out list from my computer of everybody in my life that I wanted to pray for, had prayed for, had met. I had my friends, my family, my enemies, my teachers, guys in the military, people from high school, neighbors, 
anybody ever read into it, it was like four or five pages. It was like both sides, small, 10 edition, you know, uh, the, the size of the print, right? It was small. And I went in there and I, and I took this list, not only to Babaji's Cave, where I silently read it. I took it on the Ganges. I took it in all the sacred spots and temples I went to. I figured these people were not going to be going to these places this lifetime. Most of those people will never. Yeah. But I was going to take them and their energy and pray for them. And I prayed for them in each holy spot I went to. Call it weird, odd, but you know, I, I no, said, you know, it's beautiful. I said, you know, and, and sometimes I had names on there, like, for example, I helped this young kid to save him from suicide. He was a hitchhiker I picked up like in 1990. I didn't know his name. I just put the hitchhiker. I figured, Bob, yeah. knows who is. I don't have to say that. Well, here's, here's the guy who was in the store, this homeless guy. Great. Pray for him. Bless him. So some had names, some had nicknames, some had just a, the hitchhiker, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, so it took a while. I got all those names out. And then we had to kind of go because we had to get back before they closed the ashram. And it took us forever to find this place. So we locked everything up good. And then my friend goes, you know how to go? Oh, yeah, I know where I'm going. I didn't know where I was going. I couldn't find a way back down and end up we're walking opposite direction and we're, we're higher elevation. I'm going, <laughs> and it's getting cold because those tall mountains, Himalayan mountains yeah. are casting a dark shadow. You know, it's blocking the sun. You're in a shadow and it's cold. Yeah. So I'm cold. <laughs> and I thought I was in good shape because, oh, I'm not sweating anymore. Uh, I'm dehydrated basically. Okay. Oh, I'm not sweating. I'm okay. Right. So, uh, no water, no nothing. So, we're, we're going along this cliff face and it's like a 30 foot drop, right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, I'm standing there and all of a sudden I'm getting dizzy, lightheaded. My chest is pounding. My heart is going crazy. And next thing you know, 30 foot cliff, I'm falling off. But the lucky part of that was, as I'm falling off this cliff, it's it's not straight down. It kind of, there's a couple of ledges and it kind of mm -hmm. angles. So like two or three bounces. Okay. <laughs> so it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't awful bad, but yeah. it ended up laying face up on a boulder, big rock at the bottom. Solid rock. That was solid. <laughs> yeah. So I'm laying up and I'm unconscious. And I know I'm unconscious, but when I, I'm, I'm looking at myself, I realize that I'm looking at myself laying on the rock. I, well, that's interesting. I've, I've had a near-death experience before. Maybe this is what's happening again, right? Yeah. So the next thing you know, I'm looking at my body, looking at my body, and I'm higher and higher, looking down at this body. And I'm going, okay, if, if this is it, if, if, if this is how I go, I got to see Babaji's cave. <laughs> That's great, right? Yeah. I mean, it's a lifetime thing. It's done. Hey, all right. You know, we're ready to go. And then I'm looking down at my body, and there coming out of this tall grass next to the rock is a cobra. And it's, you know, it's heads up, and, and it starts slithering across my feet, my sandals. And I'm looking at that, not with fear, but with excitement. It was like I was so in love with that cobra. I was just like, and it acted like, I don't know what you call it in, in, in Europe, but in America, they got these paddles they use to revive hearts. Yeah, yeah. Fib yeah. Defibrillators. And you go, and it Defibril jumpstart. Defibrillators, yeah. Yeah. And it was like seeing that snake and having them on my feet was like a defibrillator to my heart. Because I was lit. Honestly, I wasn't breathing. Heart wasn't beating. I was above my body. And at least... 20 feet above and all of a sudden boom and i jump up my friends watch me from the top of the cliff where <laughs> going on right but i jump up and what's my inclination i try grabbing the snake and i'm grabbing the snake and it's slithering through my hands we're talking about a wild cobra right it's going through my hands and i'm chasing it through the tall grass with my sandaled you know bare feet you know uh to the and then it ends up and, and, and I can't grab on, it won't stay in my hands. And it doesn't turn around and bite me either. I'm not afraid of it. I, I want to pick it up and hold it and yeah. hug it. You know? uh -huh. So it slithers down this little trail 
and it disappears behind a tiny little thin waterfall. I mean, the waterfall must have been, I don't know, as tall as the uh, ceiling in my in my room here. It was okay. eight, nine feet. It wasn't a big one. A little trickle of water. Yeah. There was a little pond. Mm-hmm. And, and when I got there, the snake crawled behind the, the little water. The story about Babaji and Larry Masha came into my mind. I was remembering that chapter about yeah. how the palace was materialized, you know? Yeah. And, and then he's told, go down and bathe. And he finds a little waterfall and a little place of water and he bathes. And he, you know, he cleanses himself. And I thought, nobody ever knows where that was. Right. And I'm thinking, so you- here I am lost in the Himalayas. And I dropped in on it. In my mind, that's where that's where Larry Masha bathed. That's where Babaji, you know, yeah, yeah. was with him. And I just felt so what's the word? Uh, it was like, like love was overwhelming me. It was like overflowing wow. love, yes. Yeah. yeah, it was just like, wow, is that right? I mean, this is cool, right? Uh-huh. So Anyway, so I fell down that cliff. I, I, I fell through a bunch of stuff. It was like poison oak. I don't know, poison ivy. Some kind of poisonous plant that I had. Lumps and itchy bumps all over the place. And, and I tore my shirt and I was bruised. So by the time we finally get back to the ashram, the swami out there is locking the door. And he sees us pull up. And he looks at us watching. He goes, you got 30 seconds. <laughs> so then he asks me, he says, how did it go? And I told him, I said, I said, yeah, I went up there, I fell off the cliff, I got bruised, I got, I got these, this rash. I said, I got dehydrated, I got dizzy, I had a heart attack, I had near-death experience. I gave him the whole thing blow by blow, right? And he just looks at me. And there's this lady that's listening, and she's visiting the temple there. And she goes, Don't you know what they say, Mr. And, I, and she kept interrupting with that. And I finally go, What? What do they say? I'm telling a great story, right? Yeah. And she goes, It is said that those that have the most arduous journey to find Babaji's cave have the greatest blessing. And then she just walks away. I'm going, Who's that lady? What? You know? So I'm thinking, Who else has been to Babaji's cave? Yeah. Has died there. <laughs> Yeah, literally. Lost. literally. You know? Yeah, I mean the whole thing, right? Yeah. So, so that was a, a really kind of neat experience, and even though it was a rough one physically, that was a thing of joy. I mean, absolutely. Anybody can go visit with a group, and you got a guy, a guy takes you up there, and here's where it's at. And it's a guide, and you sit with the group. No, but to go up there by myself and have the cave, just me and my buddy. And then I read all those names there. And I told, here's, where, here's where that goes. I read all those names of all those people and asked Babaji to bless them. I continue my journey and I eventually end up sunrise at the Ganges, uh, this very sacred place. And we rent a boat because we want to be out the Ganges at sunrise. And we went out and I took my list out. And I'm reading it as the sun comes up. And when I finish the last name, the guy gives me a match or a lighter or something. And he goes, and I light it. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I get down to where just hang on to it, like just the tip of it. Right. And then I drop the ashes in and the, the ganji. So those people's names and their list was with me throughout my entire journey of 2004, my first trip to India. And then I, I concentrated. I mean, I, 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 I it, it, it became almost a religious ceremony. I mean, I just released that energy. Just I just released it. I go, bless these people. And then I watched it float down the Ganges. And it, it, for somebody that's not into this whole thing, like perhaps we both are, it'd be like, yeah, okay, big deal. You burn a piece of paper and you throw. No, but it was, it was so moving. And then the, sun, the sunrises there are, are fantastic uh, for a lot of reasons because of the pollution. But, but the but it just get these gorgeous colors, right? Okay, yeah. and, you know, the oranges and all that stuff. And it's like in your mind's eye, because I didn't see it, but in my mind's eye, as the sun was coming up, it was like 
I could visualize Yoga Nandi, you know, that picture where he's standing on the boat with the sail. Yes, yes. I mean, oh, that, that was like, beautiful, beautiful. that was a thought I had when I was sitting up thinking, wow. Yogananda was on this river in this spot. I mean, I know it. That right? it was right off where they're burning the bodies and the, and, yeah. and the prayer stuff and the bathing. And I'm going, this is this is just really cool. So that was my first first trip to India. That was my, actually my second near death experience. Um, so when I was eight years old, it was sort of the first experience. Okay. I think it'll tie into my third experience. Right. When I was eight years old, I was literally deathly sick. Um, I was sent to a county hospital and basically they told my parents, uh, probably not gonna make it, he's coming in too late. I had a, I had a lung disease, a kidney disease. I had the mumps, I had, you name it, pneumonia, everything. Yeah. And uh, so I went in the hospital and I was in isolation and I'm just a little kid and they, Put these big needles in my back and took fluid out and everything. And then I'm in a bed by myself. And I'm sleeping there in this totally dark room. And all of a sudden, I'm feeling light. And I mean that both ways light, like lightweight, and light, like light. Uh -huh. Light, yeah. Both I'm ways. feeling light. <laughs> okay. Right? So, in English language, anyway, that has, you know, they're two different words, two different things. But yeah. So, and all of a sudden, I'm sitting up, but there's no weight. I'm sitting up and I realize the body, the physical me is underneath me. I'm sitting mm -hmm. and this thing is just laying there. Just, just, I felt sorry for the body. I go, this is that poor kid. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's dead, right? <laughs> so, um, so I sit up and I don't. I don't, I may have been standing up, but I'm, I'm not in a physical body. I'm in this almost like a foggy ether yep. kind of, I mean, it's, it's, it's a spiritual body. And, uh, and I, and I know that it's different than the physical. And then I look at the room because it was totally dark and all of a sudden it's, it's getting lighter and lighter and lighter. And it was like, I was in a cloud, you know, the white, the whiteness was like fluffy cloud. And I felt so much love. You know, it was like the picture this. I, I had an Italian grandmother, right? Okay. Italian grandmother hugs you and kisses you. There's no greater love than an Italian grandmother, right? right. Imagine a million Italian grandmas. Okay. Right. Just, it's like, whoa, whoa. this is really yeah. good stuff. I was feeling that. And there was this light energy and stuff running up and down, even, even though it wasn't a body, it was like my spiritual body had like energy running up and down the, what would have been the spine, but there's no, no spine. Something. Yeah. Yeah, there's no the spine. spine. Yeah, but, but this energy is just running up and down, right? Okay. And then I'm watching this panorama, this whole view, like a television screen of all these events and people and things that were going to happen to me. And it encompassed 50 years forward. Usually you have near-death experience. You think about what I do wrong. And, yeah. you know, you get a life review. Life review, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm eight years old. What's the review, right? Exactly. So <laughs> but I'm getting forward 50 years. It shows, me, it shows, the, shows my wife. I'm going to meet her in high school. I know that's going to be my wife. I see her later on. We're married. I see my children. I, I see where I'm working. I, and then I see Vietnam. And I know... I didn't know it was Vietnam, someplace in Asia, and some kind of helicopters, and I'm sitting behind these helicopters in this war, and it was all playing out, and I saw President Kennedy's assassination, I saw things in the future that were going to happen to me and my family, and I go, and I knew it, I said, I knew it, that was one thing about this whole vision that I didn't understand, which I'll get to when I talk again. Uh, was there was two numbers floating around okay. in the air, right? There was a 29, and then the two would flip over to a five, and it was 29, 59. I had no clue what that was. I didn't know. At the time, I thought, well, maybe I'm going to die at 29 or maybe 59. And 
And then somebody later on, a few years ago, oh no, no, it's your Saturn rising every 29, 59, you know. Okay. okay. I, um, okay. <laughs> but as events went on the rest of my life, it was like deja vu. Everything happened as I saw. I married, I met my wife in high school. I said, I'm going to marry her. Even though we went together in high school, we broke up and we got married six years later. She went to Cal Berkeley. I went to Vietnam, you know, but we got back together. You know, okay. we, I, I met my wife when she was, we were both 14. And as I like to tell people, I never thought I'd be dating a 75 year old woman, but I guess I am still. So there you are. So we're still married okay. over a half a century. Uh, so those numbers were in my mind. And so I, I thought when I, when I got out of the hospital a year later, I was in the hospital a year, oh yeah. a little bed rest. So, but while I'm in that hospital, there's no toys, no TV, no radio, no record player, nothing to read, nothing. Every day just in bed. I started using that time as a meditative time. I didn't know what it meant. I mean, I did my own form of meditation. I was, I was doing things as a little kid. I go, oh, what if I push my eyes together here? What if I close my ears? What if it helped? I help? I do all these weird little things, you know. That, and I said, oh, I can see the spiritual eye. What's going on here? Yeah. So eight years old, I'm exploring all these things. You know, I'm, I'm picturing breathing through my navel. I'm picturing all kinds of stuff. And some of these things that I was doing later on, I discovered, oh, those are actual techniques. You know, I'm doing it my own way, but I discovered several techniques, you know. And like when I went uh, in the Himalayas, I, this Tibetan monk showed me this thing breathing through the navel. And I go, oh, I was doing that at eight years old. But anyway, so I spent a lot of time, literally all my time, inside, inside speaking the oneness. And that's how I kept my sanity. And that's how I stayed, you know, kept from getting bored. Because uh, a lot of times I had nobody to talk to for all day. So it was, it was not a bad thing. Because people, oh, you're in a hospital a year. And I go, it's not a bad thing. Yeah. It's just, I was in a hospital a year. End of story. But while I was there, the gift was, at eight, nine years old, I really got into some deep meditation time. I learned the value of being with yourself and being inside yourself and being one with, you know, God. So that was like a big thing. And uh, so I got home out of the hospital a year later. And I thought, man, I was really sick. And all these visions I saw, I saw health issues, you know. Uh, so I better change my diet, became a vegetarian only one in the family at uh, nine years old. Kind of hard because nobody fixes anything special, trust me. So you always, you always got to fix your own stuff. So, and I, I didn't do alcohol, I didn't do drugs. Uh, I didn't do sugar on anything. I mean, I just, I watched, I was eating healthful and uh, really taking care of myself. So, let's go back to falling off the cliff. So when I, that happened in uh, October, 2004. It wasn't until first week of February that you, you know, months later, that I actually went to the doctor, you know, for a heart attack. I mean, you have a heart attack. Most people say, "Gee, I have a heart attack." So I go, I should go get checked up at the doctor. Yeah, I'm finishing my journey in India, and then I'll come back, and then I'll get around to it, right? But so I eventually had a, a heart attack at home. And I and I drove myself to the ER and parked my truck. I told my wife, ah, we're not feeling too good. I was having a full-blown heart attack. And I, and I drove myself to the hospital. I get out. I go into the ER, not where they bring the ambulances in, where they take care of you right away. I go into the place where everybody walks in. right? And you're standing along the line. I don't know where it's like there, but in America, there's about 18, 20 people ahead of me. And I'm in the line. And I get up to the front. And the nurse or the person there goes, not, you would think the first question they ask you is what's your medical situation? No, no. first question they ask me, do you have medical insurance? <laughs> and I go, yeah, okay, fill out this form to give you a clipboard, fill out all these questions. So I'm having this heart attack. I mean, it's just killing me, right? But I was showing, I sit down and fill out the paperwork. I get in a second line, there's only about six people. 
I get up there and I hand the lady the clipboard and she looks at it and she goes, huh, oh, says here you're having a heart attack. And I go, yeah, I'm, I'm having a heart attack. She says, how'd you get here? So I drove myself. I said, you stood that line? Yeah. You stood this line? Yeah. Yeah, well, we'll be the judge of this heart attack. Yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> so she gets her stethoscope out and she puts it on there. Next thing you know, she's on the code blue, code blue. Code, <laughs> you know, and next thing you know, there's a stretcher coming out. And there's, they're taking me away. And she, and she goes, you're having a really, you're having a heart attack. And I go, I go yes, that's what I told you. It's still happening. She says, why did you say so? I said, I said I was having a heart attack. You anyway, said, you just said it, yeah. So, so I, I go in the room and this doctor looks me over and, and he wants to do surgery. He wants to do all kinds of stuff right away. And, and I'm going, I said, man, this is, so I complain. I don't normally complain, but I said, you know, look, I've been a vegetarian for, uh, I'm going on, I'm just a couple of weeks shy of 59 years old, right? And that was the end of my visions just before my 59th birthday. And I go, I, I, I meditate. I do yoga. I don't eat any bad stuff. I don't drink. I don't do drugs. Uh, I don't do salt. I don't do sugar. Uh, you know, and, I, and I'm looking at him like that, like, well, I'll, I'll have to deal. So the guy looks at me and he's looking at his numbers and stuff. And he goes, Mr. McDonald, he said, I would think that with, with the genetics that you have, you probably would have been dead at 29 had you not done that. Right. let alone almost make 59. So then I'm thinking, 29? These are the two dates that you saw. 59. And you've tied it together. So the fact that when I got out of that hospital, I changed my diet and my habits, that, that erased 29. So there I was at the 59. I made it to that point. Right. And I'm thinking, I wonder if this is it, as far as my life review forward went, right? And I had, I had this, if you believe in astrology at all. I was Close. born in San Francisco, March 16th, 1946. The same time, my friend, who I met 10 years, 12 years later, uh, he was born in the same hospital. His mother and my mother were apparently in the same room. Yeah. And me and him were in cribs next to each other. We we're both born the same day, hour or two apart. He was... Uh, Paul H. O'Brien Jr. I was William Hector McDonald Jr. Two Irish kids, born the same time, same place, just our difference. He ate heavy meat. He drank. He smoked. He, he, everything you could think of, right? Yeah. He had died that year. Oh. He never made 59. So I was thinking of astrology. I go, well, we share the same astrology chart. And he's dead, right? I go, Whoa, right? You know, so spoiler alert, I didn't okay. die. I mean, <laughs> uh, so, okay. so that's where this 29 and 59 kind of played in there. But this whole thing has been kind of a, a journey. Uh, and it all kind of started with reading the autobiography as a child because that kind of it just ignited me. I mean, I was into it before. Like I said, I, I would spend time with uh, Kriyananda. Uh, but it would just be him with me and yeah. my sister and maybe my mother or something. It was just small, small little groups, yeah. Camelot, you know, small little groups. It was, it was a much more intimate association than later on, because later on I'd, I'd go to, if I went to Nanda in, uh, in Nevada city, it was like, you know, there's hundreds of people well, here. People. Yeah. 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 You, you, let everybody else have them. But it, it was kind of nice at my age because I got him when I needed it because that was the inspiration I needed before I went to the hospital. So that was a good thing. So I'm thankful for that relationship. And uh, so the naughty palm reading. Let's go okay. there. Okay. Because I didn't believe in him. Remember I said the guru was going to make me go get this naughty palm reading done. Palm leaf read. I got to be yeah. proper. Palm leaf reading done. All I heard was palm reading. I'm thinking, <laughs> yeah. A gypsy, you got to read my palm. <laughs> yeah. So, so then this guru I was with, Gurnoff, he was explaining to me how these things are done, right? And and they're written like 2,500, uh, 5,000 years ago by the great rishis. And if you got one, then you'll reach it at the time and place when you're supposed to get it. 
and you could have you possibly have more than one. So, and I'm going, yeah, okay, fine. So he's going to send me to this guy in Pune. And that's the other thing. When I find out that those leaves are spread all over places in India, they're not all in one location. Yeah, yeah. Well, naive me, right? So yeah. I go to this place he tells me to go. And then later on, I find out some people wait months to get their leaf found, yeah. if they find it at all. Mm -hmm. I go there. And you get the thumbprint. Remember, you get your thumbprint. And then and then I wrote, he says, put an initial by her so we know it's you. And I put W. I don't go by William. I go by Bill, but I put W. All right. And then I said, I'll sit here and wait. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I waited like six hours. And people going, you know, this thing could be six months. I go, I, I'll wait. So I'm naive. I figured, well, my guru sent me here. It's got to be here, right? So finally they come out. He's got a bundle. They look like Venetian blinds, right? I mean, they're all strung with strings and yeah. through this. Mm -hmm. And they called me in this little room and it's got every statue of every saint from every religion you could believe. This guy was, I mean, they, they were betting on all of them. I mean, they had Jesus, they had Buddha, they had Krishna, they had Babaji, they had Shiva, they had uh, everything and every okay. symbol. I mean, it was like, it was a little tiny room it was filled with all this incense and I mean, you had to cut the incense to get in there. And the guy goes through six leaves and they're really close. He says, close don't count. You have to answer every question. Okay. I don't know about 40 questions. Every question has to be correct or it's not yours. I said, okay. And then he comes to the seventh leaf that he has in this bundle. He says, intuitively, I think this is yours. Yeah, okay, fine. I'm still not impressed with anything yet. I'm going, okay. So then he goes through there and he and basically he gets down to your mother is, you know, Marcella. And, you know, it's not an Indian name at all, right? Yeah, at the course. time, I looked at the thing. Here's the thing. At the time, because the leaf didn't say that, it's by sounds. But I did. But in my mind, when I saw the leaf he was reading, I saw in English Marcella. Really? Oh. But that's impossible because it's, it's, I mean, if I actually had it in my hands now, it probably it would probably be all this ancient writing. Mm -hmm. But I, when I saw it, is weird. It was a weird little thing. I go, that's odd because I'm seeing that. And it looks like that's what it says. So anyway, so then he goes, and he says, your father's name starts with a B. And I go, yeah. And he says, Bill. And I go, yes. Mm -hmm. And he goes, his name was exactly the same as yours, Juan Junior, right? He was William H. McDonald's, and I was William H. McDonald Jr. There you go. So he says, father's name and your name is exactly the same. Your father's dead, your mother's dead. I go, okay. Wow. And then he goes, and your wife's name is Carol. She went to a prestigious university, one of the best universities in America. She went wow. to Cal Berkeley, so I don't know how well the world thinks about Berkeley, but University of California, Berkeley, so it was a top school at one time, may still be. And then went through and you got two children, boy, and then a girl, and you got this, that, you you write spiritually based books. Uh, you, 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 you wrote, wrote, you're going to write, a, you're going to write a book about your, your guru, your, you're a, a lover of Shiva. I, I don't know. I said, I did word for it. I said, okay, I guess. He goes, and, and, and then your guru is, and then he mentioned the guy I'm with. And uh, which is interesting because the next reading I had, which was last year, they go, you're, you're following a dead guru, who is your guru, Paramahansa Yogananda. And then you have a mentor guru alive. Okay, okay. So it was two, so I kind of clarified well, it. Because cool. yeah. at the time I was kind of like going, well, because when I met Gurnoff, who's a lover of Yogananda, he goes, uh, I said, I'm not, I, I, can't, I can't become your disciple, I, I follow Yogananda. And he goes, that's okay, be my BFF. So I'm following this mentor guru guy, I'm his BFF. Uh -huh. So I didn't have to give up anything. So it's like, I still got Yogananda, I'm happy. But to have a live person to, to nitpick your mind and your soul and, and help you, yes. the beautiful thing. So I had the best of both worlds. So anyway, so they go through this whole thing, uh, including, he says, here's a question. And if you answer this question, this will tell us that 
this is the right time and the right day for you to get this read. I said, okay. And he goes, you recently worked on a, he says, he goes there, it says in here, a play, but that was written 5,000 years ago. He goes, this is my interpretation as you recently worked on a movie, but not as an actor. And I go, yes, because just two or three weeks before I got there, I helped rewrite an ending for a Hollywood movie. And uh, I changed the ending to make it a, an uplifting, happy ending for this movie. Right. And nobody knew it but me at, oh. at, in India. Nobody knew that. Yeah, yeah, of course. And had they, had they said that to me the year before, it would have been true. And if it said it the next year, it was, well, it didn't just happen. It was last year. So, yeah, it, it was a reason. I mean, yeah, it was perfect, oh. right? Oh, right. Yeah. All right. So he goes on and on, and this and that. This is correct. This is correct. And then he goes, You've seen, you've seen basically Babaji and, 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 Lord Shiva in, in, in the form of Babaji and, and stuff like that, and, but you haven't recognized, you know, you've, you've been, you haven't recognized. Okay. But it's always been there. You know, you're meeting Lord Shiva and, and, his, and, and all these great wonderful people, but you don't see it. And, uh, but now from this point forward, you'll be blessed to be able to see it. So that's kind of a prelude to what, what happened at the ashram. So then, I thought, well, that's the reading. So I take out my wallet. I'm going to pay the guy. And he goes, no, 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 no. That's just your index card. That's so we know who you are, so we can do your reading. Oh. Oh, that's not my reading. He goes, no, no, no. That's just that's just who you are now. Wow. Okay. I said, okay. So then I hung around another rest of the day. It was into the evening. I mean, nobody sits there waiting for them to find their leaf. I mean, that's stupid, right? But anyway, but anyway, they did find the leaf. I thought, okay, I'll wait around for the reading. So they, they do all these astrology things and uh, Vedic stuff. So I come back and I got the guy that's reading the original stuff. And then I got a guy that's interpreted that into English for me. There might've been a third guy there that was interpreting too, because it was like, it's in one language and then it goes to another language and then to English. So, was, so I get up there. And the guru sent a list of stuff he wanted me to ask. Ask them what your worst sin was in a significant previous lifetime. That connects today, the worst sin. And I had some people coming downstairs that had their reading done. And some were crying, oh, I, I, I tortured somebody and cut their head off and all this stuff. And I'm going, holy cow, man. That's a hell of a past life reading, you know, so... Some people really had some really bad, you were a cheater, a thief, you know, you were. Uh, so I'm going there, going, what the heck did I do, man? And I go, he wants to find out what we're saying. So I go there and the reading starts off and it tells you all the stuff up to the time you walked into there, the present, this lifetime, 100%. So I'm thinking, well, you got all that without having to go to a computer. <laughs> and he knows more than the average guy. So I figure, well, if you got the, the present lifetime correct, Maybe, maybe he's going to do the back lifetime. So then he did, says, in, in, your, uh, in a significant past life that's connected today with the guru that you're at his ashram, basically, you used to be his senior monk at his ashram in Sri Lanka, what is now Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. And you were his trusted guy and everything and everything was great until you had a thought about being in love with the woman at the ashram. You just loved her. And that thought, the guru kicked you out of the ashram and put a curse on your mind and, and, and you wandered. I mean, I think, wait a minute. I said, I didn't do anything. I just fell in love with somebody, a thought. Yeah. Oh, yeah, worst yeah. sin of that life. I'm going, oh, good grief, yeah. that's a hard punishment, right? I mean, yeah. go, yeah. a thought, I mean, you think about all the thoughts people have every day, right? Yeah. So yeah. I said, okay. So, and then I wandered according to this, yeah, it's, it could be big mythology. And then I, I, I end up back in India proper and I'm on the, along the Ganges and I'm bathed in the Ganges. And all of a sudden I come up out of the Ganges in this beautiful light and it's Lord Shiva, and I'm a rainbow body, and I just, 
I go with Lord Shiva and the rainbow body out. And according to that reading, that's how I've ended every life they could go back and look at. Rainbow body gone. And voluntarily come back every lifetime and starting over, pain, suffering, not knowing, and then ending every life. I go, well, that's great mythology. I'm mean, going to prove that, right? Anyway, so then it went into the future. I said, okay, let's look at that because that's something I can prove eventually, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the past stuff just makes a good story. Okay. I mean, it's a good story, right? Yeah. <laughs> but it, for, for all practical purposes, there's no way either one of us can, can put any money on that, right? Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. oh, the sun's coming tomorrow. But did, did this really happen? We don't know. Okay. So by the future, they predicted all kinds of stuff. Everything they predicted but one thing took place. And the reading only went one decade forward. This was 2010. It ended in 2020 with potential of me dying in 2020. Great danger to die in 2020. And the only caveat in that was if Lord Shiva or Babaji, if they want you to serve, then you ain't getting out of here. Then your life will be extended. But your life will not be extended. You won't be given any more time just so you can spend time with your family and watch TV and write another book. And it has to be purposeful. It has to be in service to Lord Shiva, the Babaji. And uh, so I thought, that well, I can't say that odd. So there was a part of me thinking, geez, I got 10 years. You know? And they told me, you got to write this book about uh, this president guru guy, and, which I did, Alchemy of a of Warrior's Heart. And I talk about the whole experience there. And then uh, it, it talks about more sicknesses and illnesses and heart attacks. and Everything it mentioned happened. Everything. The books I was supposed to write, places I was supposed to, things. And it also predicted the experience I had with Babaji uh, in, in a hospital for my later on, we're not there yet, but it forward, you know, it was like the next year, honestly, the next year I had an experience with Babaji and it made a bunch of other predictions. And I talk about it on a YouTube video, but it was like, boom, 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 boom. And so as I was living these last 10 years, everything happening, the only thing left going into December, 2019, I'm thinking, well, everything's happened except for the death. I ain't going anywhere, man. I canceled all my trips, everything. And then COVID hit and I thought, wow, maybe. Because the prediction was, if you go to India and you're never returning, you know, 2020, that was it, right? If you oh. take a trip. So maybe there was some truth to that if I'd followed it. You know, if I would have just ignored everything and traveled and yeah. maybe I would have got COVID. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. So then we get to ultimately where all these projections were going from the reading. I was in India. I was on my way to India and I stopped in uh, Frankfurt, Germany. I, uh, I was going to stay a week. And I met these Germans the previous year at the ashram in Pune. And we had an unusual event happen. They all wanted to see me because stop in in Germany anyway, next year, when you go back next year. What happened was at the ashram in 2010, there was like about 50 of these Germans there. And I was staying over. I was one of the last Americans there. And I kept telling these Germans, I said, you know, you got to learn to visualize things. You can manifest anything you want by visualization. You know, and they just, you know, nobody's listening to this old man. Who are you? You know, what's the big deal? So one day, we're, they're staying in a bungalow right next to, to mine. And all of a sudden, I hear these Germans yelling and screaming and banging on the door. They had closed their door, and the bolt inside of the door bolted the door shut from the inside, which is impossible. Because there's a bolt, and there's a steel frame around the door. So if the bolt is out at all, it'll hit the frame, and you can't even close the door. But apparently, this door closed, and then the bolt went right into the thing. It was locked. And they were like, ah! I heard about going there. So they told me what the problem was. And they had all their stuff inside. I said, look, I'll get you to another place 
because I was kind of in charge at the time. I'll get you to another place to sleep. There's some beds over here. here go there. I said, I'm going to visualize that open in the morning and you'll be able to get in there. And they laughed at me kind of like, you know, yeah, I'll give it away. Yeah, sure. So the next day I go over there. There's nobody there. I, the door is locked. I mean, it's locked. And I just touch it with my fingers, just gently on the door. And it goes, mom, and opens up, right? And I'm going, well, too bad nobody was witnessing that. That was kind of cool, right? So these guys come down from the temple. And they see me standing there by your open door. And they go, oh, we did that. We were praying for that to happen. I said, really? I said, were you praying that I did it and opened it? No, no, we did it. I said, really? OK. So I sat in a little plastic chair outside. And I watched it. They went inside. They got something. They came out. And the door locked again. What's the odds, right? Well, it was like, yeah. <laughs> right, we're going to teach these guys, right? Let's teach these young guys. And the door locks. It's bolted. And next thing you know, we end up about 15 or 18 Germans and a couple of Indians, and they're all outside. Everybody's trying to open this door. And I'm letting them go. I, I give them 20 minutes, they're all open the door, and I'm just standing there. And I finally go, okay, y'all, you can't open the door. No, no. It's locked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Watch. And I just, and it was like, like the police banged the door open with oh. a ramp, like, ah, went, shining, you know, and all these people were like, anyway, so that's, that's what they, they thought that was kind of neat. I'm going, I mean, it was just, it was, yeah. I don't know, it wasn't a big deal to me, but they thought, oh, wow, you know, it's, <laughs> it's just opening a bolt. Come on. So the next year, I stop on my way to, to India and I, and I meet these guys uh, at the airport and then they take a train ride to Munster, Munster, Germany. And, and, and the next day, we, we go to this yoga studio where they, all these Germans show up and the yoga studio uh, had uh, about 34, 35, 36, you know, almost three dozen people there. And they're all kind of mingling around and it's, it's about five minutes to noon. I'm, so I finally asked one of the guys, what are we all waiting for? And they go, well, for the workshop. Oh, I said, what's the workshop about? And the guy looked at me and he goes, well, don't you know you're giving it? I go, really? <laughs> Just, where's the start? Five minutes. So I got five minutes. They're telling me I'm giving a workshop. And I go, well, how long is the workshop? And they go, eight hours. So I got five minutes to figure out how to interpret this thing, get an interpreter, put together an eight-hour workshop. And I go, okay, great. It, it's it's so bizarre. It's so weird. Let's just do it, right? Yeah. And, and so I gave this workshop, and I had an interpreter. You know, interpret. I'd talk for a minute or so, and then the guy would talk. And then the last hour and twenty minutes or so, I told the interpreter, I said, "You know, don't interpret for these people anymore. I want them to speak German to me. I want you to go around a room, every single person, tell me what motivated them to be there, or what what spiritually is is their is their. I want to know something about their spirituality, why they were there." what they were thinking, whatever they want me to know, right? You know, give me each about a minute or two. And, uh, and he goes, well, why? He says, you don't speak any German. I said, it's not the point. So went around the room and all these people talked and they all kind of looked like uh, they're speaking German. And, like, and I'm watching them all. I'm reading, not word for word. I'm reading the energy, what they're saying. So when they get through, the tripper standing next to me and he goes, Okay, there you had your thing. And I go, I said, I pointed each guy and I go, well, here's this guy, blah, blah, blah. This guy's this, 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 this. And I did them all but one lady. And he goes, how'd you all know that? And I says, because I read them. It's, yeah, I don't need the words. I don't need to know any of the words, yeah. but I read them. And he goes, then why'd you skip that young lady? She was about 30 something. And I said, because she came here today because she'd read that I was a healer and she's got terminal cancer. She'll be dead in three months and she wants me to cure. That's not her karma. She'll be dead in three months. I didn't want to tell her that. He goes, I mean, these people didn't even know. So three months later, I get a notice. She's dead. Oh, you were right. I go, no, no surprise. I was sorry. I was right. But because of you, 
you know, you got to look at people's karmic thing. Unless God tells you to do something, you don't just run off and do it. This is karmic for people. You just don't. In fact, you don't heal people. We don't heal. People. It's all God. Yeah. So unless you're working as the waiter, the waiter in a restaurant, right? You're not cooking the meal. You're not eating the meal. You're just taking it from the cook to the person eating it, right? Yeah. Well, same thing with the healing. You're not the healer. That's God. And you're not the one being healed. You're just the waiter. You're just yeah. serving the energy. You're letting it flow. All right. So I'm trying to explain that to people. That's, anyway. Yeah, that's a great so, analogy. Yeah. So it's when people start, especially, God, I see all these new agers. I'm a healer. I'm doing Reiki. I'm, I'm doing this. I'm going to heal this person. Oh, heal my grandma. She's 99 years old. She's dying. Can you save her healer? I'm going, don't you guys ever say, Lord, it's your will. Bring these people peace, comfort, love, help them in their transition. Everybody wants to avoid their karma. Yeah. Like I got surgery coming up on my face. I don't go, God, save me. and you know, cure me. I go, I love me. I'm happy with me. Whatever happens, it's okay. There'll always be a good story. Yeah. I know it. God will take care of me, whatever it's supposed to be. And if it's, my nose is gone, my nose is gone. It doesn't make any difference. You know, it's a disposable yeah. body. I try to tell people, oh, your body. I said, don't worry about my body. It has a lifetime warranty. <laughs> yeah, that's a great analogy again. Yeah, yeah it, <laughs> for as long as I need it, right? Yeah, and, of course. <laughs> and and it's gone, right? So, all right. So now we're going to get into the third near-death experience because it bears on all this previous stuff. It bears on uh, the reading and eventually on the Babaji, kind of ties it all together. So I leave Germany and I'm having chest pain, so I'm in Germany. I'm actually having a heart attack. I, I recognize it by now. I had like a dozen or more. <laughs> and so I get to India. And I'm there way early before everybody else. There's only a handful of people at the ashram. I'm there. I want to spend, I used to spend three, four months at the ashram, which is, if you can do it, that's really a great experience. Three or four months immersed in an ashram environment. I mean, it's, it's great. Well, you're there at a center where you're kind of immersed into it all the time. But people coming there from the outside, when they have stuff going on, you know, a couple, two, three weeks, they just go, wow, this is really kind of, it, it gives a different feeling. But to go someplace where at the ashram, I barely talk. It's quiet most of the time. But I went there and I was introducing Gurunov to these big audiences in India, you know, in Mumbai and Pune and all these different places. And he'd have two, three, four thousand people at some of these venues. And some venues would only be four or five hundred, like for the Women's Club of Pune. Uh, and I would get up there and tell stories and introduce them. And I mean, just Funny story on that. We got if we got the time, I got the stories. Of course, whatever you want, absolutely. All right, good. You're you're easy. You're easy because I'm an old Irishman. I, I I don't get tired, and I have no pride about continuing to talk. It's like yeah, you know, I'm not humble. I can keep going. All right, oh, so I'm introducing Gurnoff uh, to this women's club, and it's all these rich, powerful women in Pune. There's 300 something of them. And they're all speaking English. I noticed even when I'm not in the room, they're still speaking English to each other. Nobody speaks the Indian language. They all educated, they all speak English. I go, well, that's, that was an unusual thing for me to see. I thought that's really kind of odd. And uh, so this, this couple of women come to me and they go, oh, we're gonna introduce Gurdjieff. And Gurdjieff tells them, no, I'm introduced by, by Bill. Well, uh, he, we're gonna give him two minutes Two minutes. That's it. And if he's not done, we're, he's, we're going to take him on. And the Gurnoff looks at me and says, I want you to tell this story, this story, this story. I want you to give your normal press. I said, well, don't, give me don't worry about the time. So I go up there and I talk for, I don't know, 20 minute introduction, right? And then after the, after the whole presentation, we're in a hotel room and these ladies come in, I go, oh, boy, I'm in trouble now, right? Because I went 10 times over their, their two minute limit, right? So they come in and they go, oh, Mr. Gurnoff, Gurnoff, uh, uh, what a great introduction uh, 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 Mr. McDonald did. Uh, 
And he stayed within the two minutes. And Gurdjieff laughed. But it was like, really? like, like a time warp. Yeah, yeah, just, yeah. They only saw it as two minutes. It was 20 minutes plus by the, by the clock. Wow, yeah. And I didn't leave anything up. And Gurdjieff, and he just laughed. He goes, yeah. <laughs> So that's me too. Don't worry about it. Anyways, that's kind of stuff that was happening in India. So at one venue in Mumbai, it's an outdoor venue at sunrise. I have this heart attack. I collapse. And uh, anyway, later on in the day, uh, I'm sent to ER and they're going, you should, you should go home. Right, you know, you should go back to America. So I'm, I go back to the ashram and, uh, my last day at the ashram, I'm packing up and everything. I'm sitting in the uh, the kitchen. And you know when you're sitting in a chair, like in a movie theater, and somebody's behind you, looks at you, and staring at the back of your head, and you, you know, what are you staring at me for? You know somebody's staring at you, right? Yeah, you know yeah, it. You can you, feel somebody staring feel at you. It. Yeah, you can yeah, feel yeah. it. So that's what it felt like. And I turn around, and I got Zubra Teshwar. Well, maybe. His arms folded, they put his hands behind the back. And not just, you know, a vision, blurry lines, you know, in and out. No, the, a physical body. Wow. Boom. It's it's Sibra Teshwar standing feet away from me. And I'm going, okay, I'm getting close to dying here. And I, I gotta go back. I don't know what anybody what anybody else notices anything. So there was a couple of young ladies that were into yoga exercise and they were just learning the meditation and it was fun and they were at the ashram having fun they were i, I wouldn't classify them as very serious nice people but not really seriously into it uh, and i asked i said do you do you see anything behind me or anything and they go what are you crazy there's nothing there do you feel anything no you sense anything no what's wrong there's nothing there and they just started japping so then there's this guy from texas Young man, I go, do you, do you see anything? And he goes, wow, he says, there's this blaze of light behind you. Wow. It's just this light is shining. He says, and I'm feeling loved. It's emanating from that light. I feel loved. Wow. I go, okay. And then there was this guy, this lawyer from uh, Los Angeles. And I, I said, uh, what do you see? Brian was his name. I said, Brian, what do you see? He says, well, you're not going to believe it. And I said, no, no, try me. He says, I see Sibra Teshwar standing behind you with his hands behind his back and folded hands, looking just like Gurunov does when he's talking to you and looking like you. Wow. And I go, yeah, that's exactly what I see, right? So that was my last experience the ashram. Fly home, I collapsed at the airport in, Col in Colorado, Denver. I got paramedics for six hours. And they, believe it or not, they let me get back on the airplane fly to Sacramento and I end up in the hospital. I'm in four days in intensive care before they can even operate on my heart. So I end up going into this heart surgery and it's one of those surgeries where they stop your heart, stop the lungs, cut your artery off and they hook up your artery to a machine. So it's pumping oxygen in. So your heart's not beating, your lungs aren't moving so they can operate on your heart. You're on a heart and lung machine. And so the guys tell me this before the surgery. And I go, well, if I'm not breathing and my heart's not beating, am I dead? And he goes, well, we're keeping, you, we're keeping the, body, the body alive. He said, we're keeping the body alive. Yeah. We're oxygenating it. And, and I said, no. I said, that's, yeah, but I'm not breathing. And the heart's not beating. And he just let it go, right? And I thought, well, basically, I'm, I'm dead at that point. Yeah. You're just artificially keeping me alive, right? Anyway, so... Guy says count count backwards from 100 and I get to about 98 or six or something. I'm out of it. But I'm laying naked on a metal table and they just put a thin sheet on it. I'm cold. They got the room real cold because they don't want warm temperatures to breed bacteria. So and then they cut the, the chest open, the rib cage, and and then they they just start cutting away and quadruple bypass surgery for the heart. So I asked the guy just before I go under, I said, when I'm on this machine, am I going to feel everything? Because 
obviously you're probably not going to give me the same amount of uh, anesthesia. And he goes, that's, that's correct. He says some people, about 5% of people, they, they kind of say they feel a little bit of something. Well, I was one of those 5% of the people that felt a lot. Anyway, another story. So I'm unconscious and all of a sudden dark and then boom, I'm not in that hospital room anymore. And I'm not an astral body. I'm not a rainbow body. It's like I bi-located. I'm in a human body, flesh and blood, and I'm in India. Now, one of the predictions of my naughty palm leaf reading was at a certain time and place, which happened to be that, that year, that, that month, I was supposed to go to Southern India and go to this certain Shiva temple. And when I got there, my instructions were to walk uphill from the temple. Uh, two, three, four hours, whatever it took, walk uphill. And at the top of this hill, the great rishis would be waiting for me. And, and they would, you wouldn't have to ask them any questions. You would already know all the answers. That was a really crazy prediction. I'm going, really? So next thing you know, I am physically standing in this little plaza next to this temple. And I noticed there's a, you know, that uh, bull outside, you know, so you know, it's a Shiva temple, right? It's a Shiva temple. And then I'm going, wait a minute. And I know intuitively, this is Southern India. This is the temple I was predicted to go to, but I didn't, I thought I had, was going to go on a real trip, but I'm there in a real body. And then I'm thinking, because I'm a modest guy, I go, wait a minute, I got close, I'd look. I had clothes on. So I, it was a modest experience. I didn't show up naked like I did on the, the, the table of the operation. Yeah. But I'm showing up there and I got clothes on. And it was kind of odd. I thought that was an odd, that was an odd thought I had. I said, that's odd. But a modest guy, God takes care of you, right? Yeah. So, and I feel people bumping into me, looking at me. I hear them talking and stuff. I'm not there as a vision. I'm not there as astral traveler. I am actually there in a second body. It's me, but yep. it's also me sitting on that table getting carved up. So I said, okay, let's forget this stuff. Let's just, let's walk uphill. I got time. It's going to be an eight hour operation. I could spend a couple hours walking uphill. So I walk up this hill and uh, I could smell the, the, the flowers growing. I could feel the breeze in the air on me. I feel everything. Every once in a while, I could feel things in my chest, like somebody had their hands or tools and they're doing stuff, right? It was an odd feeling, but it was like what they were doing on the table, I could kind of sense it in this body. You can sense it. Which was, which was kind of interesting, but I figured it's an odd experience. Why not? So I finally get to the top of this hill and there's this little campfire. And there's these guys with these crazy hairdos, you know, like the Rishis, right? You know, you know, like weird they look like they belong in Jamaica, right? All these weird stuff and beards and everything. They're all sitting around on logs and rocks and, you know, and, and around this fire. And they just look at me. And then, then this Gurunov guy is there too, the guru from the, you know, from the ashram. He's standing there. Yeah. <laughs> so I get there and I realize I don't have one question for these guys. I, I know what I'm supposed to know. I just like, I, I, I don't have a question. As crazy as that sounds, there was no question like, why, how come that? It's just like, it was like it was all downloaded, boom, you know it all, there it is. So I'm sitting there or, stand, or standing, I'm still standing at this point. And there's a part of me that goes, this was such a painful experience, what was going on in my body and recovery is going to be you know, painful and I've had, dozens of heart attacks and I got congestive heart failure and all these things going on. I thought, you know what? If this is my time to go, I mean, I love life, but uh, I'll go. I'm not going to fight this. This is beautiful. So all of a sudden, this panorama again, this cloud shows up. Okay, what's happening now, right? So this cloud shows up, but it's not a what I'm doing. There's this sea of faces, faces looking at me, children, adults, even some animals, old people, young people, sick people, 
spiritual people, all kinds of people. And his feminine voice, sounded feminine. I don't know if it was a woman or not, but it really sounded, it sounded like a 20 some year old beautiful lady. That's what, that's, I was just thinking, wow, this dead lady, whoever she was, it sounded like, like a woman. And she goes, Bill, you've done enough for everybody already. You have no obligations, no karmic reasons to hang around. I promise you peace, love, no pain, joy, bliss. Just give up your heart. Come with me. And I'm going, wow. Yeah. And then the guru guy, Gurunov, you stand there while this is going on, on this hilltop. And he's looking at me and he goes, Bill, don't give up heart. You can skip a few beats, but don't give up heart. And I look at him, I go, she promised me bliss and all that stuff. What do you, what do you promise me? He says, I promise you come back. More pain, greater pain than you ever had. More suffering than you ever had. He says, you used to have pain before. You bliss out and it would always go away. But now you're going to have to learn how to conquer pain so you can teach people how to handle pain. And I go, wait a minute. That's your offer? That's your best offer? You know, pain? I should say, oh, yeah, I don't want the pain. He says, if you don't come back, all those faces up there, all those souls, you owe them nothing. But you have lost the opportunity to give them a gift. It could be a smile. It could be a hug, understanding. It could be a spiritual technique. It could be psychologically you've helped them emotionally in some way. You stopped a suicide, whatever it is. The world would be a better place had you come back and, and did this. But I promise you great pain. So I'm thinking, so I'm, I'm analyzing this, right? And all of a sudden, back on the operating table, they've jump started my heart. They've taken me off, and they just, you know, the paddles. And, and all of a sudden, my body there on the hill jumps. And then by the time I flash to that, I'm laying on the table. I'm not moving on the table. I mean, I'm there strapped down and doing all I don't know what they do but they had my eyes they had my eyes taped shut and I had a thing down my throat so I couldn't talk couldn't see but I'm hearing them the anesthesia is worn off and they still gotta reconnect the rib cage they gotta sew up you know various things and they got tubes in me they're still cutting and, and, and working on me right and in my mind I'm going hey guys hey I can't talk, right? I got this thing down my throat. I go, hey, I feel everything you're doing. Oh. Come on. Tell you. Oh and, and so it goes on another 45 minutes or an hour. I got no pain medicine. I mean, instantaneously, they promised me more pain, right? Instantaneously, I'm getting pain. So I, I'm not doing really good. And I'm in the hospital. Usually, you get a heart surgery three four days to kick you out in America. Uh, you know, kind of heal at home. You know, I, I, I've been already a couple of weeks there and I'm not, I'm not doing good. My body keeps filling up with fluid. And every time I lay down and close my eyes and take a nap in the hospital bed, I'm back in that other body on the hilltop, having the same exact experience over and over and over again with the guru saying, you know, don't give apart. You could skip a few beats, but don't give apart over and over and over and over again. And I'm going, you know what? I'll go down. They just gave me five blood transfusions and everything. I'm going, God, I'm ready, right? So all of a sudden, it's one night when I'm getting ready to have a, another blood transfusion. My phone rings about 11 o'clock at night in the hospital bed from India. You know, I, I, I got to answer this. They're getting ready to do something for me. Hello. And, uh, and he says, this is Gornoff in India. <laughs> like, like, how many Gornoffs do I know, right? Come on, <laughs> yes. only one. Come on. Okay. So yeah, yeah, I know who you are, right? He says, and then the next thing he says, don't give up heart. You could skip a few beats, but don't give up heart. And that's what he says. And he'd been saying it for 10 days every time I was unconscious. That's what he says. Wow. And then he goes, because he, he's looking for another trick to get me to hang around, right? And he goes, he says, Bill, 
I just told all these people at the ashram that I'm going to heal you, and I want them to go up to the temple and pray for you. You don't want to embarrass your guru by dying. So I go, uh, yeah, okay, fine, you know. So I told my wife, I'm going to be out here in 36 hours. Go, yeah, yeah. And I told the doctor, yeah, yeah. I was. But now what happens, let's go down to the last full day at, 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 uh, at the hospital because this is where the last of the Dottie Palm predictions comes in. The prediction was you'll be sitting, laying, you'll be, you'll be standing. I didn't know what, but you, you'll be there and out of the sky, Lord Shiva, as one of his emanations, which would be Babaji or whatever, you would, you would feel oil and water and a blessing on your forehead. And you'd be anointed by the great one. So I'm picturing, you know, okay, I'm going to be out someday and the rain will come down. I go, okay, the rain, God's blessed me with the rain or something, you know. But So I'm sitting up there in this bed and I look up and at the end of my bed in the hospital, there's this guy with no shirt on, a young Indian with long black hair. And I go, that's Babaji. You stand there and he's got Levi's on. Hey, it's my, it's my world. So uh, there he is. And he's, and I'm thinking about it, I'm at the end of my bed. At the end of the bed, it's like six, seven feet away. Yet he's pouring oil and water on my forehead and touching me here. But he's at the end of the bed. And I'm, at the time, it, it didn't jive. Like, well, yeah, that's that's correct. You could, he could reach seven, eight feet and do that. I, anyway, so that's happening. So I'm getting this blessing on there. And I'm, and I'm just feeling so good, so wonderful. And I thought, well, nobody sees it. But maybe I'm delusional. Maybe it's just me, right? So then I'm out of the hospital a couple of days and my daughter comes and says, oh, our old neighbor, David, came and visited me. You know, David's just a regular guy, doesn't know about the history of Babaji, nothing, not into anything weird. He's just straight, you know, straight guy. And he says, yeah. He says, David said he came to visit you at the hospital on whatever day it was. And I said, no, he didn't. I didn't see him. He says, oh, yeah, yeah. He says, he said he came into your room but he was watching some crazy young Indian guy pouring stuff on your head and chanting some crazy language uh-huh. and, and no shirt on and no shoes. And, and, and he <laughs> thought it was crazy and he didn't want to embarrass you. So he just left the room because he wanted to embarrass you. Oh, uh, wow. So I told my daughter the story and she goes, Oh my gosh, he's David saw it. I go, yeah, I guess it's real. So anyway, so that was one of the, that was like the last Things that was predicted that the, the heavy stuff there was a lot of small stuff. So all these things happened all up to that point. So then uh, there was one thing that was significant with Babaji since we're talking about Babaji. In 2010, I had half this nose was amputated off. They took this off, and and then they rebuilt it from my shoulder. So this all rebuilt. I think it's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, except for my recent surgery where it's all red, I, I heal amazingly well. So I go get the surgery done and I go to this, they've already cut it off. And the next day I'm getting plastic surgery to try to repair it. And there's this doctor and he goes, oh man, this is really, this is a lot worse than I thought. You know, I'm a, you know so he looked at the, you know, the, the pictures and he, so he'd planned this thing out. He had a, a graph, you know, little squares. He had a picture of my face on it, and he showed how he was going to do that. And he wanted to cut the forehead in a triangle, fold the skin down, fold it over the nose so it would grow. And then six or seven surgeries later, he'd get rid of the bump, and then he'd fix the forehead. I mean, and he was going to take pieces of my ear. and build. I mean, it was just going to be a crazy surgery. He says, don't worry about it. I've done this for 30 years, same way. And I go, well, you know what? I trust God, whatever it's supposed to be will be. So my wife heard this story, too. She goes, what, you're going to do what? Yeah, yeah. And he, I saw him. Okay. So when I come out of surgery, I come out of surgery. There was no cut on the forehead. There was no, it was bandaged up here. And, and my wife goes, well, what happened? He says, you know, what's interesting. I got in there and he says, I've never done this in 30 years. But I changed my plans. I was inspired to try something totally different at the last minute after he did all these things was totally prepared to do this thing, restru- re- reconstruction. He had it all figured out. And then he just ad-libbed it. And he, and he skipped all those other things. And uh, 
But what he didn't know was the day they cut the nose off and I went, went home uh, and I didn't take any pain pills or nothing. I just, it was, it was terribly awful. But that next morning, and I'm sleeping in another room because I don't want to disturb my wife. Four o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in my Shiva hour, right? My room is just lit up. I got bandages over one eye and all across the nose, but all of a sudden the room is like bright lights, blinding lights, like the sun is there. And I open my other eye up and I look, and there's this arm, this naked arm coming out of this sun, this whatever you want to call it, this orb. orb. Okay. Yeah, big orb, some kind. Right. His arm is coming out in a hand, and it just does this. And it's just like the whole body was radiated with love. Wow. Beyond love, it was just, and it was just, and I didn't get excited. It was like, well, there's a hand coming out of my wall, and there's a sun on my wall, and uh, that's like normal. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. I didn't even get excited. It was like, Okay. And I don't know how long it lasted. It could have been an hour. It could have been a half hour. It could have been, I don't know, no time. So I woke up the next, got up the next morning to go to the surgery at six o'clock in the morning. I felt totally assured. I go, you know what? Whatever this guy wants to do, it'll work out all right. And that's the guy changed his mind and changed the whole thing. It was after it was a couple hours after that, right? right. So then, right. and then he gave me pain pills. I didn't use them. So the next morning at four o'clock in the morning, a repeat, blazing light wow. and coming out because the first hand healed the, you know, the damage with the, you know, all the ticket, all the nose off. And this one was rebuilding it. And he put his hand over the rebuilt nose. And uh, 10 days later, I go to get some stitches out. And his doctor is like, he's like, what the heck? Skin. Skin had grown over all the stitches. Skin don't grow that fast. No. Cover all stitches. <laughs> and the nose was really ugly, and then it got not so bad. So I I went to this wedding that I canceled. I was invited to a wedding, and Gornoff was, was going to be there, too. And I canceled it. Then I go, you know, this, this looks pretty darn good. You know, I'm going to go to the wedding, because I didn't want to look like a freak. So I go to the wedding, and I'm sitting there at the table. There was nine people. And Gornoff goes, this is not off the top. He just kind of goes, beer. What you had the other night was not a vision, wasn't your imagination, wasn't a dream. It was the big boss coming to heal you. He calls the big boss, Bobby. It was the big boss. And everybody going, what, 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 what? He goes, tell him. I go, so otherwise I wouldn't have shared the experience. So I, I shared it because it was really sacred, you know, when he told tell them. And, uh, and then he just nodded his head because yes, and he looked at all the people and he says, that really happened. So uh, so I had that experience verified that I had the guy that, uh, you know, saw Babaji in the hospital. And, and then the other one that the, where Babaji frightened me, the guru knew. And uh, there's a couple other more events, but uh, anyway, that kind of gives you a flavor of what happens and what transpires. But the Babaji's experience, I've shared for them publicly. I will tell you this, they promised me in my naughty reading that I'd have more pain, more suffering, and they delivered. But by the same token, I have now managed to develop some healing techniques for pain that if you follow them, I don't care if you got a broken tooth because it worked for my broken teeth, broken teeth or whatever you got, you can overcome the pain through self-love. And I've been teaching that and I got several videos on that. And we can do another interview in the future where we can talk to people about, about self, make it a separate video. We can talk about self-healing techniques because it's always about self-love. And what people have to realize that all healing is self-healing. We are yeah. all God. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Everybody's looking for the answer outside themselves. Heal me, heal me instead of mm -hmm. heal me. I'm I'm in charge, right? Yeah. 
But when it comes to healing, one always has to be sensitive to the fact that whatever you got is karma being burned. So don't go just running around trying to heal everybody because it may not be the right thing to do. It looks like it's the right thing to do, but it may not be the right thing to do. You take away that karmic disposal thing that's happening, now they still got to face that karma. So there's something to think about. I hope that kind of gives you a thing. We could, we could do further talks on this, but I think, I think we kind of nailed Babaji today, uh, other than the fact that uh, many people I hang around with uh, have been altered and changed by, by experiences that I've had. Every one of these Babaji's experiences has, has had ripple effects, like waves on a pond, like a big rock got dropped. So nothing happens to you individually uh, that doesn't benefit or hurt somebody in some way. So people always keep that in mind. So when you have beautiful experiences, I was always taught by self-realization, don't, don't share them, keep them to yourself, they're sacred. But I've been given, and that's a good policy to follow because it keeps the, you know, the, the ego down. Uh, but I've been given orders by several swamis, several readings of my nadis and cards and everything. Every reading I've had, Vedic chart and everything else, gives me an order, including the guru I hang around. You have to tell these stories because they're not for you only. We're giving you these experiences because others need to believe and others need to be able to realize that things are real. These things really happen. And it's all about having faith and love. When you love yourself, you open the doors to the kingdom of God. Hope that uh, entertains you, if nothing else. I'll, I'll be willing to come back anytime. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Bill. And it was an awesome interview and an awesome experience i'm sure that for everybody who is going to watch this you know and uh, you are doing a great job uh, you know sharing these experiences and uh, it's for 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 a purpose so for a great now, if you want if, if people want to contact me they can if you give okay. me my, my email okay. address share my website yes, please yeah share yeah uh, yeah my please. website www.rev rev bill Nick Donald. Okay. Dot com. Rev Bill McDonald dot com. Okay. And, uh, and if they want to email me, it's really easy. Yeah. Huey, H U E Y five seven six okay. at gmail dot com. So okay. Huey Helicopter. No, Huey Helicopter five seven six. That was my helicopter. So Huey five seven six at gmail dot com. Okay. But I, I'm here for you anytime your group wants me. Okay. I'm not a proud man. I keep talking. That's that's absolutely great because you know I have listened many of your talks and interviews and absolutely love them and they help me and you know they keep you inspired and these stories about Babaji are really wonderful and I thank you so much for what you're doing and uh, I'm really happy that we connected and uh, I'm sure that this interview also will help me help many devotees uh, here at Ananda and also in worldwide. Are you going to post this on YouTube? Yes, yes. I'll, I'll, I'll give it to. I'll give you the. I'll give you the link, and you can. So. Okay, good. And I'll share that, and you'll get some outside viewers if you don't mind. That's great. Absolutely. I, you can share what when, whenever, whatever you want. You can share it, and that would be wonderful. Great. Thank you so much, Bill. Yes, we people. are in contact. Uh, much love in, in Master and in God. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye.